bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome in to the Bet the Board podcast. NFL Week 11. Some interesting games on the docket and a unique scheduling quirk as far as Bet the Board listeners are concerned. More on that a little bit later in the program as you'll figure it out when we get to the fifth game. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only Pain Insider. And Pain, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit disappointed you didn't decide to make the trip out to the West Coast and be sitting in the paddock for Red Bull when F1 debuts on the streets of Las Vegas later this week. I don't go to the one in my backyard. Why would I travel for I mean, miles? Miami yeah. Gardens isn't anything close to the Las Vegas Strip. Let's not sugarcoat driving around Hard Rock Stadium versus what? driving by iconic properties down Las Vegas Boulevard. I did have the great pleasure of trying to get from casino to casino while that was in the initial phases of construction and going about half a mile took 20 minutes. Uh, in an Uber. So uh, I, I did get to witness you know, that part of it. No, I am going? not right now. If ticket prices drop, I've been poking around a little bit uh, to try and see. There is the potential that I may get there, but as it stands right now, I am not ponying up the cash uh, that it will take to get me anywhere close to create a meaningful experience. I feel like your agent's got you 38 jobs. What are you talking about? I mean, look, are, are, are we, tumbling the, quick. the prices no are tumbling quick, thing. but we know the football season we've had. So you have to be judicious with how you allocate your funds to try and get yourself back in the black. Interesting word choice there. So, all right, let's get into the games themselves. Um, When we look at some of the overall scoring trends so far in the NFL this year, uh, scoring remains down. Teams are averaging just a shade more than 21.8 points per game, the lowest through week 10 we've seen in the NFL since 2009. We're going to spend a lot of time on today's show discussing the AFC North. And when we look at that, those quartet of teams, I mean, all four teams in that division are allowing less than 22 points per game this season. The last time four teams from the same NFL division finished a season pain allowing 21 points or less per game was the AFC North back in 2011, which provides the perfect segue into prime time to talk a little Bengals and Ravens with the Ravens, a three and a half point favorite on a short week, welcoming in a Cincinnati Bengals team fresh off a loss in their own right against the Houston Texans last week. Total on the game, 46 and a half. And when we look at the Cincinnati Bengals, you're going to hear it early. You're going to hear it often. The Bengals have lost 14 straight road primetime games. It's the longest such streak, losing streak, I should say, dating back to 2000. Four of those games have come with Joe Burrow at the helm. When we look at the Bengals' upcoming schedule, it is the NFL's hardest remaining strength of schedule. Opponent winning percentage north of 650. Every team they'll play going forward is at least 500. So if the Bengals are going to erase that 0-3 start to the season, they're going to earn their berth in the postseason. Meanwhile, the Ravens, it feels like a broken record, but this is a team that loves to lose games where they have leads late in the contest. They've led in the final two minutes of every game this season, yet are only 7-3. and three. They're the 10th team to lead in the final two minutes of each of the first 10 games since 2000. Those other nine teams' pain were a combined 89-1. and one. Bengals, great as an underdog, 6-0 and ATS. The last six games, they've caught points. Joe Burrow, 9-1 and one ATS. The last 10 games, he's been listed as a dog. Meanwhile, the Ravens have struggled as a divisional favorite, going 1-7 and seven ATS in the last eight. I lay all of that out to try and figure out the most compelling case to be made for or against the dog or the total. When we look at this Bengals offense, they'll be operating without T. Higgins against the Ravens defense pain that was billed to be one of the best in the league. They looked anything but when Jerome Ford ran right, ran left, and it was the Browns erasing a 14-point deficit to come away with an improbable victory last Sunday. That was us. We billed them to be the best defense in the league. I thought that was going to be their statement game. It certainly started that way. Let me ask you this. What would you, you make of that game before we get to this one? I, I continue to not comprehend what we see on a weekly basis this year. I, 
if you had being down 14 and the way to get back into the game was leaning on Jerome Ford and two backup tackles on your bingo card, better man than me. Uh, I mean, and look, the Cleveland Browns defense, you know, they answered the bell, gave up 17 points. Essentially, it was a short field for the Ravens. It was a Kyle Hamilton pick six. And I think the most incredible part of that game was that the Ravens, we come to find out, were gashed by a quarterback that had his arm held together by bubble yum and a little bit of scotch tape going 14 for 14 in the second yeah. half. So just one of those data points, that you'll sit there scratching your head. And when you want to anoint the Ravens as the best team in the AFC, maybe the entire league, they go out there and prove that they can't be trusted with nice, with nice things. I mean, how many times over even the Lamar Jackson era, can you say, hey, someone went into Baltimore, was down multiple scores, and the way they got back in the game initially was just out physicaling them. I mean, it's just, it rarely ever happens. So to see that combination, it was very interesting. In terms of this game, right, the Thursday night game, we got a, we got a doozy finally. I know we've been kind of just grazing through some of the matchups because the Thursday night games have been horrific, but you get Burrow who has been on fire since week five. He's completing over 76% of his passes. He's getting the ball out quick. What is interesting here is you dig a little more into this, and Mike McDonald has had some pretty strategic game plans against Joe Burrow and the Bengals' offense in the four-game sample size that they've kind of squared off against each other three times last season. Certainly the matchup earlier this year, Burrow wasn't 100%, but McDonald's kind of taken the opposite approach of how Wink Martindale was defending Burrow and the Bengals offense prior to him getting there. It's far more light boxes. It's a lot more zone coverage looks. Virtually no man coverage. Rarely is is McDonald blitzing Burrow in these matchups. So you're seeing like lots of quarter coverage, tons of cover six. So you know the play basically starts out with what would appear to be seven in the box, but then you're dropping two out into coverage typically one backer one safety you mentioned Kyle Hamilton with that pick six kind of envision that where he's hanging out along the line of scrimmage and you can either send him on a blitz which typically hasn't been the case or you're dropping him in into coverage the Bengals have run the ball kind of in spurts this season got it going a little bit against the 49ers but as a whole just middle of the pack and efficiency so It'll be interesting when the Ravens do show the light box. The Bengals are going to have to be somewhat successful running it. I do think we just see more of that approach of, hey, Burrow's just going to run the show here. We're going to keep him in shotgun. We're going to have him dictating this game, kind of playing point guard, get the ball out of his hands quick. You mentioned Higgins is out. Let's also keep an eye on Charlie Jones. Would be nice to get him back in the mix with with Chase Boyd and Irwin. You do have the lead Ravens corner, Marlon Humphrey, out for the season with the torn Achilles. That's a big loss. Now Baltimore secondary has kind of lived life without him before, especially the first four weeks of the season. Brandon Stevens is is coming off like a nice four-game stretch. Rocky Sin did return from a two-game absence last week, filled in for Humphrey, wasn't very good in that role. I just do get the vibe if the Bengals can protect Burrow, he should be able to move it relatively well. I'm just having a tough time on this side of the ball based upon what Mike McDonald's done to Burrow while also trying to process how a broken Deshaun Watson was able to finish the game 14 for 14 against the Ravens defense last week. There's kind of some quiet insinuation that their defense is starting to get a little bit worn down. Now you're on the short week. The market's saying that the Bengals are going to have success offense. What's interesting, too, is some of the comments that came out of the Bengals' performance last week against the Houston Texans from Brian Callahan, and he was overly honest, said, we sort of game plan thinking we weren't going to have him, him being Jamar Chase. Some of those things take reps and time, even though Joe and Jamar have played a lot of football together. So what is the end result? I mean, Jamar Chase finishes the game with the third most targets behind Tyler Boyd and Tanner Hudson. Now, knowing that you're going to have Chase, T. Higgins, look, not going to factor in whatsoever into this game plan so you have to think chase will be the alpha out there force the ravens to cover him and open up other avenues to be able to make things happen now on the other side pain i mean the reason that the cleveland browns were able to come back down 31 to 17 in that game against the baltimore ravens is because the ravens offense didn't put on their 
their foot on the accelerator and land a knockout blow, but that was against the Cleveland Browns defense. In steps a Cincinnati team who allowed the Houston Texans to do whatever they wanted when they wanted, and that included Devin Singletary running the football with reckless abandon. Uh, It included C.J. Stroud connecting on countless deep plays over the top. When the dust finally settled last week for the Bengals defense, who was down Sam Hubbard, 17 explosive plays to the Houston Texans, 28 first downs, and 544 total yards. C.J. Stroud generated eight passes of at least 20 yards, and there was a sense that uh, he had more trouble against man-to-man than zone. Lamar Jackson needs to stretch the field. If there's a game where the Ravens want to utilize all of their weapons, this has to be the spot where Todd Munkin says the hell with it. We're chucking it deep, and we're going to force the Cincinnati Bengals to defend our boys in space. Yeah, it's always interesting because we had discussed Lamar's splits with zone and man, and he would just been so much better against zone. But you do have the data point early in the season where Lamar was pretty effective going against the Browns and in their heavy man coverage usage. It just didn't materialize in the second uh, meeting there. But I would expect the Ravens to be balanced because of the down and distances they should be in. The Bengals defense right now has been really poor relative to expectation. You look at early downs, which is, you know, very much predictive of a defense. You know, you can kind of win some red zone roulette and, you know, have some late down variance on on third and fourth go your way and it can make things appear better than it is, but very predictive early downs. 27th in EPA per play allowed. They're allowing nearly seven yards per play on first down. That's 31st in the NFL for the Bengals defense. Harbaugh has, has talked about getting Keaton Mitchell a little bit more involved in the, the Ravens offense. He does bring this you know electric speed dynamic to that unit. Some of the outside runs could be effective for Baltimore without one of the men you mentioned there and Sam Hubbard setting the edge. He is going to be out tonight for Cincy again. Hubbard is ninth and run stop win rate among qualifying defensive ends so he's just very very good setting the edge you even look with hubbard in the lineup cincinnati on the season struggled to stop the run 29th and schedule adjusted run defense so I, I do think that provides some balance tonight to where it's not all on lamar trey hendrickson is going to battle through it was supposed to be an mcl sprain that could potentially keep him out multiple games saw a video of him practicing yesterday they were not happy about that they apparently told some of the local beat writers hey you can you can film some things but none of the drills um that didn't end up happening so you see trey out there practicing without a knee brace going through some drills very surprising to say the least now there wasn't really a ton of hard cuts we'll see if he's braced up for tonight but um there was also a, a pretty interesting presser this week from Lou Rumo talking about not just how good Hubbert and Hendrickson are as players but how they allow his entire scheme to work and so if we know Hubbard's out. If Trey's on a limited snap count or isn't completely effective, that can be really troublesome. If you look at the splits with Hubbard and Hendrickson off the field simultaneously, like, ooh, ooh, baby. Uh, they're allowing over 11 yards per drop back. So to your point at the top, maybe you see a little bit more of an, uh, an explosive pass game. We're still trying to figure out why Zay, Zay Flowers isn't being used more down the field. The speed's electric. We, we saw him burn dudes deep at – at Boston College, I understand he's very, very shifty after the catch in, in, in short space, um, but I got to start leaking him out a little bit more. But we also thought that the Bengals secondary coming into the season could be a little bit of a problem. I think we've mentioned Cam Taylor Britt. He's been the best of the Bengals corners so far, but he's just 43rd out of 126 qualifiers. DJ Turner just isn't quite there yet. Shadobi still doesn't look 100%. The safety group has struggled. But you look as a whole, the Bengals have allowed nearly 50% of dropbacks to grade successful bottom five in the NFL. We saw this morning a little bit more money. All right, you're thinking short week, familiarity, right, all of the primetime trends that are out there. Very, very sharp move on the over at 44. There was a second group willing to take the second number and go over 45 and then again today at 46 we saw a group willing to take the third number and and get it to the key of 47 looking at like first half full game total trends this season very substantial position was taken on the first half at at anything better than 22 and a half um 
we'll see if there's some some late resistance here. But you're talking about three or four different factions, all all kind of agree. You mentioned Zay Flowers. And I mean, some of the numbers are staggering. According to Next Gen Stats, no wide receiver in the NFL with a minimum of 20 targets has been able to create more separation versus man to man coverage than Flowers with three yards. He's been open three or more yards of separation on nearly 56 percent of his targets. So you wonder why they're trying to harness the talented rookie out of Boston College. Maybe this is the spot where they can unleash him knowing that he had a big game last week against the Cleveland Browns in a similar spot, uh, albeit in a loss for the Baltimore Ravens. But from Thursday night pain into Sunday, where we'll have another pivotal showdown, one that takes on a very different dynamic in the AFC North between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cleveland Browns. The Steelers this season have been the definition of cutting it close, going 6-0 in one-score games, but the Browns no strangers to tight games either, as they're 3-0 and in games decided by three points or fewer. When we look at Mike Tomlin, 26-6 and one all-time versus the Browns. It's the most wins versus the Browns by any head coach in the NFL history. They have the best record in a hist- in NFL history by a team outgained in nine straight contests as it'll continue to be rinse and repeat for the Steelers. 19 wins without scoring 25 plus points over the past three seasons. Tied for the most in any three-year span since 2000 when, go figure, the Steelers accomplished something very similar. Beat the Browns week two, aided by two defensive scores and a long broken coverage play to George Pickens. Here comes the Browns with a new quarterback under center in Dorian Thompson Robinson. They're six and three despite having the worst passer rating in the NFL. It's the second best record through the week 10 of the NFL season since 1970 by any team that had the worst passer rating going in. And if you believe in a little bit of momentum, the Browns trailed for 59 minutes and 20 seconds last week against the Baltimore Ravens. They had never won a game against the AFC North opponent when trailing by 14 plus points, previously 0 59 and 1. The Steelers, they have been an ATS juggernaut somehow, some way over their last 16 games, and the Browns have been an under machine, going 7-0-1 under the total the last eight home games. Payne, here comes the Steelers' offense that can be best described as risk-averse, and it's paying off for now. I mean, Mike Tomlin hasn't minced words, said pretty much our goal is to minimize mistakes. Kenny Pickett knows what's going to be asked from him. And if we don't turn the ball over, we can win those games up against the Cleveland Browns defense that was electric last week and is doing all sorts of incredible things when you look at their stat lines. Should be able to have some opportunities, maybe to create a short field or two if Pittsburgh feels like they're in a generous mood. Yeah, I mean, that has been the MO of the Steelers offense. Just don't turn it over. Believe they have eight on the season that leads the league in in the least amount of turnovers, and that's kind of how they've been lucking their way into some of these wins. I think this is a really tough matchup for Pittsburgh on the road against this caliber of defense. You go back to week two, and I understand, you know, Deontay wasn't there, um, but the Pittsburgh's offense was held to a 28% success rate in that matchup. It was the lowest mark of the week for any offense in by over 10%. So, uh, it was not a very good matchup then. I don't know if it's going to be one here. We've talked about Matt Canada's offense many times, and you just think about what they are, right? Above average run rates. Kenny Pickett not really stressing defenses by using all parts of the field. It's really gotten worse. If you look, Pickett hasn't attempted a throw between the hashes in two straight games. So it's like, hey, we're going to be predictable and run. When we do throw, it's, it's, it's going to be short and outside and there's just not a ton of creativity i don't think the steelers skew too far from that game plan which is you know just again run the ball throw it short keep it outside once every blue moon you know try to hit a safe deep shot as long as the game state allows it maybe if if pat fryermuth returns we see more throws over the middle the steelers did kind of activate that 21 day window for return and there was a direct quote from fryermuth saying hey no issues felt great very comfortable out there doing all the normal stuff so it sounds like it's trending well for fryermuth jalen warren was named the starting running back we'll see what that actually means in terms of of snap share The Browns, we know season long, have been pretty dominant against the run. First four games, they were were number one in rushing success rate allowed, number three in EPA per rush. It has dipped a little bit um, since week five. It's still a top 10 run defense in in both EPA and in success rate. but they've they've given up some longer ones. Obviously, we saw the explosive with, with Keaton Mitchell getting outside last week. You just kind of get the feeling 
that there isn't going to be much here offensively for Pittsburgh, not just because they're they're porous, but but their style. Um, unless DTR is is starting to stress them a little bit and you're playing from behind, I would just envision the goal for Pittsburgh is is to remain mistake free. Um, it's kind of wild to think about where we are right now with this with this game, right? I mean, Chris opened 38 on Monday. That got flushed out in a couple hours. Buy orders even came in at 36. Then yesterday, we kind of stagnated at 34 after Watson is announced out for the season. And then as soon as DTR is announced in and it's not P.J. Walker, we're down to like a, a preseason number of, of, of 33. It just kind of tells you, you know, if the Steelers don't need to push offensively, they're probably not going to. Uh, You mentioned Kenny Pickett not really throwing into the middle of the field. You look at George Pickens. He's been relatively quiet over the last couple weeks, just six catches for 66 yards and a touchdown. Over his last three games, he had 237 receiving yards in the previous two contests. Deontay Johnson, the Steelers have downplayed, saying it's not a big deal, but he was nowhere to be seen at practice yesterday, but he was made available uh, to the media dealing with a thumb injury, so something you're going to want to keep tabs on. He finished the game, though, last weekend against the Packers, but for a player who works in the short and intermediate space, you don't have your thumb. It tends to be a little bit of a problem in terms of catching footballs. Uh, on the other side, Payne, here comes a Browns offense where fifth round rookie uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson out of UCLA will make his second career start. 19 to 36 against the Ravens earlier this year, 121 passing yards, three picks and a 28 to three loss. But when asked what they're replacing or you look at the numbers, Deshaun Watson, 29th in completion percentage, 25th in yards per attempt and 18th in touchdown interception ratio among 33 qualified quarterbacks. And until he went 14 for 14 in the second half against the Ravens last week, you'd be began to wonder if the light bulb was ever going to come on for Watson and what he needed to do to lead the offense. So last week, what did the Browns do? They turned to Jerome Ford and his week 10 performance finishes third in the league with 40 total yards, rushing yards over expected fourth in yards per carry over expectation and third in rushing efficiency. The Steelers defense depleted at linebacker. You have to imagine even with a banged up O line, the Browns have one path and they're going to try and do everything they can to exploit it. Should they be able to find victory this weekend? Yeah, Cam, Cam Hayward is is back, and that's a nice piece to have in the middle. So uh, it might not be as easy to run the ball as it was in, in the first meeting or even potentially last week, but you're going to get that fired up. In terms of DTR, what's the downgrade? I think that's probably difficult to assess. I know our numbers basically treated DTR and P.J. Walker the same, which I, I'm not sure is a th- thousand percent accurate because i do think dtr has the higher ceiling we've seen what pj walker is if you kind of extrapolate out some of his numbers and epa and completion percentage over expectation among you know quarterbacks with 500 dropbacks over the last like decade pj walker is you know at the very bottom um so i i think you do have a little bit higher upside here so long story short is like When we look at DTR, the positive for him this week is that it's his week. They understood that this is a guy who's going to get all the first team reps. It's going to be a game plan within the system catered to his skill sets. Whereas the last time we saw him against Baltimore's defense, it's like, hey, is Deshaun going to play? We're not quite sure. Deshaun was throwing a little bit on Friday. We don't know if DTR is starting. And so you kind of throw the kid into the mix without that you know being geared completely towards him and unsure if he's going to be the guy now he's got all week right mentally physically to prepare for this and I think it could look a little bit different behind a a run game that's that's a little bit more supportive which he didn't quite receive in that matchup against uh, Baltimore so I think we'll see some some ability here for Cleveland's offense to have mild success you're going to fire up the RPO game and you just make it ABC one two three paint by number right we're handing the ball off to Jerome Ford if the read is there, we're keeping it ourselves. If not, what you mentioned in the middle where the Pittsburgh Steelers are decimated with linebacker injury, and it's going to be a Landon Roberts, who's more of the heat-seeking missile type than a factor in coverage. You're already down Minka Fitzpatrick in the middle. All of a sudden, we can now locate Najoku in that RPO game over the middle, or we're going to see some crossers with Amari Cooper and just kind of paint it by number there where we got three options. Right, we're handing it off to the running back, we're keeping it in ourselves, or we're watching Landon Roberts bite up close and we're throwing it over his head to a crosser or an Ajoku. So I think 
the game plan there is going to be pretty simple. If it's not there, don't turn it over. We're going to punt it away. We're going to let our defense go to work because we feel like that's the largest mismatch in this game going back to, to the Browns defense versus oh, Steelers. Look, offense. I mean, this is a Cleveland team who a lot of people write off and rightfully so, but if DTR can start to scratch the surface, he's not going to be asked to do a ton. It's not a team that's capable of erasing deficits, but in a game like this against an offense that lacks a lot of big play potential in their own right with the Pittsburgh Steelers, maybe it fits into the Cleveland Browns wheelhouse uh, in a game that we've seen the Browns open as a four-point favorite earlier in the week, get to as much as a one-point underdog at a couple shops out here in the desert, uh, before those ones were cleared out and as we look at pick them and minus one kind of the prevailing price tag uh pain when we look elsewhere on the sunday slate an interesting game maybe for all the wrong reasons in the afc east come sunday afternoon where it's the jets going out to western new york to take on the buffalo bills the bills a seven point favorite in this game total 39 and a half and 40 depending on where you shop the jets come into this game having gone 36 straight offensive drives without a touchdown it's the longest active streak in the nfl the dolphins actually had more offensive touchdowns in the week three demolition of the denver broncos 10 than the jets have all season with just eight the bills meanwhile have the second best scoring differential in the afc plus 78 and while that scoring differential is outstanding, uh, they have, they're one of the worst teams from a win-loss record standpoint through 10 games all time, f- trailing only the 1981 Atlanta Falcons, who are plus 88 at this juncture in the season. When we look at the Bills, when they've tied or leading by one score in the fourth quarter for a defensive-minded head coach... Probably not pulling the right strings. McDermott's, McDermott's vaunted defense drops to, you know, towards the bottom of the barrel in EPA if you go off true media's numbers. But rather than trying to figure out some of the X's and O's here and, you know, diagnose what's been wrong with Zach Wilson and the Jets offense that lacks big play potential or figuring out the Bills' defensive ailments for what arguably is a bottom three unit the way it's currently constructed, what did you make of the Bills parting ways with Ken Dorsey and what do we think that means going forward in terms of an overall offensive philosophy when you listen to Buddha Sean McDermott talk about creating a subculture within the offense. <laughs> I busted your balls a little bit. Uh, he did go a little Buddha. I'm not the yoga guy. You've been trying me, trying to get me into that. That feels more of your area to dissect, but <sighs> kind of be somewhat careful here. I think everything that we've been talking about the past few years is is coming to fruition i'm not saying that you know you take it all the way back to the day ball days right there was a lot of contention there in his final year and it really pushed him to taking the giants job obviously he wasn't going to turn that down but initially when Dayball did not get the Charger job and the ability to work with with Justin Herbert. There was some, there could have been the idea of, hey, I'm gonna gonna hang around here. We're gonna light it up for another year. I'm gonna prove my worth, and then I'm gonna get a better job in a better situation. But he ultimately was dying to leave, and then we saw Leslie Frazier effectively get outed. And so you've had all of this success for Buffalo. You've done everything but but win the Super Bowl. And McDermott just keeps putting more of his his stamp on this team and you see what direction that's heading. And specifically with Josh Allen comes out this week and it's like, hey, um, yeah, I'm taking it personally that Ken Dorsey was fired. That was his guy. That was his quarterback coach before he was elevated to OC after Brian Dayball took the Giants job. And it's very clear that, you know, listen, Ken Dorsey's offense, was it perfect? Was it as brilliant as, you know, Brian Dayball's when that thing was was humming in, in 2021, in the beginning of 2022? No, it was a little clunky. You could dissect certain play calls and be like hey this this feels weird here in this spot but overall I mean, the buffalo bills offense top three and schedule just efficiency third in epa per play that usually doesn't scream hey let's let's shit can this guy <laughs> you know 10 weeks into the season so he very much became a scapegoat and i think we kind of divulged how this could potentially play out in the preview series i think maybe a month ago we discussed there's going to be a turning point for for Ken Dorsey. He's either going to have to put his foot down and call his game and, and get shit Ken, and he can explain that to people later, or he can kowtow down to McDermott and 
and go his way and do everything that McDermott wants, and that may hinder his ability to get a job in the future because the offense won't be nearly as efficient. And so it appears he has taken the former path, and you can kind of see it, right? I mean, think about what's going on here. You had Josh Allen come out, what, three weeks ago? After the the Buccaneers game, or maybe it was right before there, and he said, you know, hey, listen, I feel so much more comfortable coming out with tempo, coming out with three, four wide, dispersing the ball, gaining some confidence, getting my legs going. And we saw that executed the first few drives of the Buccaneers game. Apparently, it was going so well that McDermott just had to end the party at nine o'clock. Um, that's basically what he did there and almost cost him the game with a Hail Mary that phew, that would have been something. So, you know, you kind of fast track that to the Bengals game. And, you know, you don't have the performance you want there offensively. Some turnovers bit you against the Broncos. You were moving the ball. My guess is McDermott not only sees the loss, but sees that they were able to get Cook going late in that ground game, and it was pretty efficient in the final touchdown drive that Buffalo had, and he's thinking to himself, why wasn't this going on the entire game? And so he just thought, should have gained the guy, right? Just that, I mean, Ken Dorsey was the scapegoat here. I don't know what this means moving forward. You obviously have Joe Brady, someone that was widely thought to be a great offensive mind we understood you know i think we've discussed over the years some of the the back and forth there where you know he was pried away from sean payton in new orleans and that was that pissed him off a little bit and you saw what he was able to do at lsu and then all of a sudden he goes to carolina and it's it's horrific there and so you're you're not quite sure of what joe brady's abilities are because it's obviously much easier to operate a college offense with with joe burrow and jefferson and jamar chase and it just didn't look that way in Carolina. So what are you going to get here? Is it going to be a more run-heavy approach? I, you know, I don't know. I don't think this just suddenly ignites a fire where the Bills offense is just going to come out humming. I, specific to this matchup, right? I mean, Robert Salah and the Jets defense have stifled better versions of this Bills offense when that Bills offense was playing with with greater confidence and in better form. And you kind of see the Jets getting tons of natural pressure on early downs without blitzing. So they're likely to be able to get some pressure while still playing coverage. Internally, I don't really want to get too much into that, but did indicate some off the field issues towards playoff time last year with with Josh Allen. I feel a little bit better talking about it now that it's kind of come public and that, you know, he had a little bit of a a breakup from the old lady and now he's he's moved on to something new and obviously some some things floating around out there about Diggs and, and Josh Allen and the women of which they hang out with. So I there's there's so many things going on here. Um I, I think what's interesting, Todd, and I don't want to keep going on this, you can feel free to interject here it concerns me a little bit moving forward think about who had to call the players only meeting offensively last week it was the new guy even though he's the veteran he's the old guy he was the new guy to this team it was Latavius Murray and so you have the players only meeting and then you go out and lose so usually you get the one game bump off of the players only meeting. What's crazy here is my, for the first time in a very long time, just pure core numbers, throw out all the drama, throw out all the bullshit going on there. It would show some value in Buffalo. I just, I can't get there. And so it doesn't surprise me that we've seen under money in the market. Let me kind of just phrase it that way. So that's that's kind of my my take here. I don't I don't think this is suddenly going to get fixed. Your take, sir. What how are you feeling on this now that that we've kind of gone at nauseum at this 
this little breakdown here of of what's going on internally. Uh, I mean, look, it's a team that's got to figure out its identity. And I think Sean McDermott trying to find a scapegoat any way he can to protect his job. Uh, it's always the situation that you point your finger one direction. You can't get rid of the players. So what's the other alternative? You get rid of some of the members of the coaching staff in one way, shape or form. Yeah, I uh, I wholeheartedly agree there. I, I'm not really sure what this means going forward. We'll find out here here soon enough. But uh, ultimately, this game became a lot more fascinating because of the the things going on internally in Buffalo. And I so you'll I, th- I think you'll know here pretty quickly. When you look at Buffalo overall, I mean, you look at their upcoming schedule. Clearly, they'll have their work cut out for them if they're going to get into the playoffs. More. They're, when they're, do you? Yeah, I was going to say, and the first time we've talked about them for a Super Bowl favorite coming into the year, you know, when do you begin to go, okay, this team has reached a rock bottom price and you can begin to buy in, or does it feel like there's something even bigger um, than what you're seeing on the field? Because I'm an idiot, I realized that I actually had you on mute, so you probably didn't hear. No, I'm going to have to go back and listen to the whole thing. So if we peel back, if we peel back the curtain for our listeners, you go through, you go through all of that, and I go, wait a second, I have to go back and listen like the rest of the listeners when everything goes live. So I try and take your verbal cues as best I can, and the joys of doing 500 of these and hoping that I can get directionally correct, just like you do dealing with cell phone reception. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I had you on mute there for for the vast majority of that. But I was I was, I did mention um, what was interesting is that you know we've been trying to fade Buffalo here, and there was a group that that put out a buy order at seven last week. But I thought the sharpest guys in the world were were on the Broncos. Now, did they expect to win the game outright? No. But what is what is odd to me, and I was I was indicating for the first time in oh, shit at least three weeks. The number does depict some value here um, on the bills. I just I can't get myself there. And the same group that put in the buy order at seven on Buffalo Monday night or ahead of Monday night, rather, against the Broncos did also bet the look ahead line that was 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 six and a half on Buffalo. And that's kind of why we got to a seven there. I don't think things just immediately get solved here because of of Joe Brady. I don't know what he is. And I I, I did say earlier, right, like struggled in Carolina. I would assume getting promoted here and being picked by McDermott would lend itself to doing things that McDermott wants him to do. (laughs) It's just... Something I said a couple weeks ago, it's like, you know, you get the vibe of your quarterback coming out here and saying, hey, I love to do A, B, and C. And your head coach is just saying, no, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And it's shocking to me that someone in that position can't just take a step back, take a deep breath, realize how close you were to winning a Super Bowl, doing things that maybe you didn't necessarily love but was successful and now all of a sudden that your, your your fingertips are all over this thing and you're shit in the bed that you would at least be cognizant to be like, hey, um, maybe I need to take a, a step back here. Maybe I need to kind of transform things back to how they were. And I don't know. I just I don't see this getting immediately fixed in this spot unless Zach Wilson just turns the ball over a ton and sets up some short fields, which can build some confidence. Like if you just said, hey, you know, the Bills offense, how are they going to operate this week? One, I couldn't tell you exactly the the plan of attack. Right. I mean, got some really good information ahead of the Bucks game. And, and sure enough, right, we went we went three wide. We went tempo. The loss of Dawson Knox was a blessing in disguise. Here with Joe Brady, you would think after the firing of Ken Dorsey, this is going to look more like what McDermott wants it to be. And that's not necessarily how this offense is best operated. No quarterback run game if it's up to Sean McDermott. Josh Allen, you are a pocket passer. You are not allowed to try and create some of those extra yards in the rushing game. But, yep, it'll be interesting to see if they can implement a new philosophy, at least on some level, against an opponent that, quite frankly, has had their number in recent meetings. The Jets have covered three straight 
but two of those coming as a double digit dog, this number much more competitive, at least on the surface, um, than what we've seen in the past. Of course, Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, at least for four snaps when they met that opening Monday night of the season. And when you mention the Bills, we may as well mention the opponent that knocked them off uh, on Monday Night Football, the Denver Broncos, who return home to welcome in one of the hottest teams in the NFL, the Minnesota Vikings. Denver, a two and a half point home favorite total on the game, 42. And the Vikings can become the first team since the 2011 Broncos with Tim Tebow under center to win five straight games without being favored in any of those contests. They're the fifth team since 1950 to start three quarterbacks during a five plus game win streak. And they've now won five straight games since Justin Jefferson was injured. I'm not saying it's because Justin Jefferson was on the shelf, but maybe you don't need to pay wide receivers as much money. If we're thinking outside (laughs) the box, different discussion for a different day. Uh, no, interesting I, take there because the 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 analytics guys are saying that they're they're one of the more valuable positions now, and you've seen the yeah. Well, as long there. as you have Jordan Addis, this this is this is just the season, or I'm going to let you finish. No, 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 you're exactly you right. I mean, look, that, right? Like you're you, Justin Jefferson's out. Okay, you're on your third quarterback in the last how many ever weeks during this streak. <laughs> just no go out there and win games, baby. Welcome, well, for a welcome team that now has better point differential this year than they did last year when they won 13 games. The Broncos come into this contest, though, uh, of back-to-back wins as touchdown underdogs. First time they've accomplished that feat since at least 1970 uh, as a franchise and the first team in the league to do so since the Cincinnati Bengals did it back in 2020. Obviously, it gets easier pain when you force five turnovers against the Kansas City Chiefs. You force four turnovers against the Bills. You know, these are two teams who I feel their stock is at the top of the market, which always makes a game like this difficult to handicap. It's not like you're buying low on one team, selling high on another. So when you begin to look for a matchup that you think can be exploited in this game, is it the Vikings offense against a Denver Broncos defense that's a far cry from the group that gave up 70 against the Dolphins? Or is it the Denver Broncos offense that operated in fits and spurts for portions of the game last week against a Vikings defense that is rapidly grabbing what Brian Flores wants to institute. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a good question. Maybe we'll get to Josh Downs in a little bit, but it's probably safer to discuss the other side of the ball. Um, I think the blueprint for Denver right now is 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 pretty crystal clear, right? It's it's all about being low variance. I don't know if it's as low as is the Steelers' offensive identity, but it's run the ball with Javante Williams. You know, sprinkle in McLaughlin and add a dash of of Pirine. And you just look at the Broncos right now, 26th in pass rate over expectation. So it's all about the ground game. Offensive line, which they allocated a lot of resources to this offseason, has started to finally mold with some of its new pieces, right? Denver is third in run block win rate, moving towards being top five in adjusted line yards created. So they're getting a good push now. Minnesota on the surface has been fantastic negating long runs. They've really prevented some of the busts and the explosives. But down to down, Minnesota, 22nd rushing success rate allowed in non-garbage time situations. So you can move the ball methodically on the ground against them. When Russ does throw, Sean Payton has him being very careful. 31 out of 37 qualifying quarterbacks in intended air yards. Occasionally, you'll see the patented Russ Moonball. That's what drew the uh, pass interference against Buffalo and set up the game-winning field goal late there. But most of it is is short passes. Russ in this spot is going to have to be pristine with pre-snap reads and then be decisive post-snap and then deliver with a quick trigger. Because there's some, some cat and mouse here with how the Broncos pass game will work here, right? I think when you look at Brian Flores, still bringing a ton of heat, 49% blitz rate, highest in the league. Russ is graded out QB 30 when blitz. Now, if Russ can get it off, he's going to have some opportunities. The Vikings play gobs of zone coverage. It's mostly cover two. It leaves a lot of open areas there where you can just say, hey, this I can read a pre-snap. I know that this area is going to be open, right? This defender can't cover that area quick enough. Russell Wilson has torched that specific type of coverage that Minnesota uses, right, in cover two. He's QB two in passer rating against cover two. So that becomes the interesting dynamic to that. Listen, we, we've seen some sharp under money in this game. We talk all the time about key numbers, 44 being one of them. We're down to 42. It's no surprise, right? Back to the underwell with a conservative Broncos offensive game plan and improved defense. 
the Broncos defense has gotten healthier. First five weeks of the season, the Broncos stop unit was on this historic rate of failure. Dead last in EPA per play allowed by a long mile. Since week six, top 10. Now, yes, some of that has to do with some some nice variance in terms of turning its opponent over. But I think this this game has just kind of taken on you know, a little bit of an interesting tenor in that you know, there were really sharp betters hoping the Broncos covered Monday night but didn't win outright so they could come back here and lay one or a cheap money line. I do think if this gets to three, the Vikings at that price will become interesting for some. I I always try to deliver it straight. Like, there truly is no hot take. You look at the film, you comb through the data, you share some opinions with, with the sharpest guys in the world, and sometimes... You know, the facts negate a great feel-good story. The sharpest people in the market will tell you how they feel and what's truly going on if you pay close enough attention. I know last week we went under 20 and a half in the first half of the Vikings game. Within 12 minutes of the podcast going live, some of the sharpest shops moved to 19 and a half right through the key of 20 despite us not winning in the NFL publicly this season. Justin Jefferson was out. We anticipated K.J. Osborne being out. That was... The word we got, even though he was cleared, he was out. We expected Hawkinson. Son to be of a bitch, up. TJ Hawkinson. Now, he went. He went absolutely nuclear. But on Sunday morning, right days after our podcast, you had all of the insiders reporting Hawk would be limited, would be on a snap count, potentially only used in short yardage in the red zone. You get two more layers of confirmation on that total in groups going under on game day. And I know, right, there's there's two, three guys, the vocal minority attempted to deliver an expose on, on what variance is on social media without an actual understanding of it. So it's probably, for me, it wasn't worth continuing the dialogue, even though I don't mind interacting with, with people online. But you think about what Josh Dobbs was last week. Quarters one, three, and four. <laughs> Josh Dobbs had a negative 0.04 EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. If you extrapolated that out for a career, that number equates to being substantially worse than Josh Rosen. Okay. In fact, that would make Josh Dobbs the worst qualifying quarterback in that category since 2012. But for 11 minutes out of 60, all 11 of those positive minutes coming in the second quarter, Josh Dobbs went nuclear. He had the very best, best adjusted EPA per play of the week during that sector. If you extrapolated his second quarter out for a career, Josh Dobbs' career would have been three times better than Patrick Mahomes. That is the very definition of playing worse than Josh Rosen for <laughs> 49 minutes or playing three times better than Patrick Mahomes' career for 11. That is the exact definition of variance. So what you get here, I I don't know. And that's why I think there'll be a little bit of a, a battle here. Um, I would assume with the total now coming down to 42, the Vikings are going to be an extremely attractive teaser like, right? Make make a low variance Broncos offense beat you by by multiple scores, beat you by margin. I do believe well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know if we're getting to three, but I think if we got to three, right, there'd be some 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 interest in the Vikings straight there. There was some interest a little bit earlier in the week on on the Broncos on a cheap money line. So I think again, just one of those games where a little bit of a difference of opinion, but the one that seems to have meshed uh, among multiple multiple groups was was the under on this one at, at 44, even some some bites at 43 and a half. You and mentioned TJ Hawkinson set an NFL record, 10 receptions, 128 yards and a touchdown, becoming the first tight end to ever put up those kind of numbers in a single half. So for all the NFL insiders that thought he was going to be limited, the only thing that actually limited him him was the fact that it's a 100-yard football field. If it was 150, he probably would have gone for 200 yards the way the Saints elected to cover him or not cover him in that second quarter. Uh, you can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there as well. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod, And you can also follow our injury analyst, Dr. Deepak Shona, who normally joins us on Monday, had a prior commitment, so he wanted to provide a little bit of an update as far as some of the marquee players, what it means for your fans fantasy lineups, and your handicapping going into NFL Week 11. Are you injured or are you hurt? <laughs> 
When injuries occur in the NFL, you need someone to call on. If you hurt, you can still play. If you're injured, you can't. Let's check in with Dr. Deepak Chona. Stanford and Harvard trained orthopedic sports surgeon and founder of Sports Med Analytics, the industry leader in data-driven injury analysis. So are you hurt or are you injured? All right, let's do it. Starting with tonight's game, first, Jamar Chase. Now, he was dealing with that back contusion. The good thing about these is that their performance hit tends to recover pretty quickly. Data projects him at 90% this week. Now, of course, he did have good numbers last week, about 120 yards, but a season low six targets. So we expect Jamar Chase looking a lot more like himself with full strength week 12. Then his teammate T. Higgins is, of course, out tonight. The average hamstring takes about three weeks for a wide receiver, and when they come back, you usually see an efficiency dip as well. So T. Higgins has a chance, depending on practice availability, to return week 12, but with likely an efficiency dip whenever he does come back. Marlon Humphrey is out, as is Ronnie Stanley for the Ravens. Now, Keaton Mitchell, interestingly, for last week had a very low workload even though he did produce and the data actually does suggest that he was dealing with a hamstring strain and these may have been related so typically running backs do see lower workloads when they are listed even if they play through hamstring strains notably he is no longer listed with one of those so we would expect a little bit bigger workload for Keaton Mitchell Then Trey Hendrickson on the Bengals remarkably is going to play. He was dealing with a hyperextended knee. The typical absence on these is two to three weeks. So the fact that he's going to play means there's a little bit of concern for a potential performance hit and re-injury risk here. Nico Collins sounds like he's going to play. The data at this point projects him as a 60% chance and it'll get up to about two thirds or 70% depending on how practice goes this week. Now, Nico Collins dealing with this calf strain just last week. Performance dip, not usually so much the concern as is re-injury risk of about 15 to 20%. Damian Pierce missed practice Wednesday. The fact that he's missed now over two weeks of practice, in my eyes, essentially confirms that he's dealing with a high ankle sprain. And therefore, when he does come back, which will likely be I would think week 12 more likely than week 11. He will also, at least according to the data, likely have a performance dip of about 15 to 20%. Devon Achan is coming back this week most likely. And the good news here is that these MCL sprains usually don't cause much of a performance hit. And in addition, they're they're usually a three week average injury being out five weeks now is a heavy outlier so we highly expect Devon Achan to come back at 100%. Jalen Hurts of course was dealing with a bone bruise he was playing through it all but he wasn't looking like as explosive as a runner and that will likely improve it does take four to six weeks for this very painful injury to really heal but with two weeks off now you would expect major improvements in how his knee is feeling and therefore he will likely be able to run a lot better than he looked in when we last saw him in week 10. Then Matthew Stafford. Now, this one is interesting. He is likely playing this week. We don't expect much of any performance hit. The only concern with Stafford is if he hits the thumb again on somebody's helmet or on a tackle and drives it into the ground. Again, that's really the only concern. Otherwise, Matthew Stafford will very likely look like his old self. And it's a similar issue with Justin Fields. As long as things go well, we don't expect any performance hit. Justin Fields already logged a full practice. So essentially, I would almost guarantee that he's playing this week. But with Justin Fields, if he drives that thumb into the ground on a bad tackle by chance, that would be the concern here for a re-injury. Deshaun Watson, of course, out for the year. It sounds most likely what happens is that the shoulder partially dislocates and, and chips off a piece of bone in the socket called the glenoid. Now, the recovery from this, the surgery results are pretty good, and return to sport rates are very high. 
the recovery from this takes about three to four months for him to start throwing again and then usually in the four to six range i would think probably in the six range for him to return to contact activities so we don't expect any limitations on deshaun when he comes back at the start of next year Kyron Williams is eligible to return week 12. Most players would. He has a high ankle, though, so when he does come back, the data projects him for a 15% efficiency dip. And you have to wonder if the Rams are going to be a little lighter with his workload. He was basically seeing every snap and every carry before he got injured. Darren Waller is eligible for a week 14 return. Now, with Darren Waller, though, the question is, one, the Giants are a bad team. Two, he's older, he's had multiple hamstrings this season, and now he's he's had multiple severe soft tissue injuries, about four by my count, in the past five years. So with Darren Waller, you have to wonder, for, he's eligible week 14, but it wouldn't be surprising if he's held out a little longer than that. Traylon Burks has not yet returned to practice, per Teron Davenport, the Titans insider, he has not yet cleared concussion protocol and there doesn't seem to be tremendous optimism that he's about to so with Traylon Burks I am, would think that the data would predict that he would come back this week but he did look like he had a pretty severe hit so if they take it slow with him wouldn't be totally surprising it would be a little surprising if he comes back later than week 12. Keenan Allen dealing with what looked like an AC joint sprain of his shoulder on the video Now, he was able to return this last game and still played pretty well. And most AC joint sprains don't cause extended absences. So I would suspect Keenan Allen does return to practice at some point this week and plays this weekend. Usually see a very mild performance hit of about 10% in terms of production. TJ Hawkinson, he played last week through a rib injury. And actually, ironically, these typically do cause performance hits of 15, sometimes even 20%. But TJ Hawkinson had a great game. So there's no reason to suspect anything different. He was limited in practice on Wednesday, but not suspecting anything too drastically surprising here. Ramon J. Stevenson, low concern on this one. He was dealing with what sounds like a back contusion or back spasms. These sometimes act up, so there is a re-aggravation risk, but it's relatively low, and the performance hit from these is also relatively low. So Ramon J. Stevenson, pretty much full send if you were starting him before. Then Josh Downs, they're luckily on by this week. Josh Downs is probably playing week 12 because he played week 10 on a freshly re-injured knee without even practicing. Didn't look like himself in terms of the box score and the numbers, but that's kind of the norm. Actually, most players would have even missed the week 10 game here. So Josh Downs probably playing week 12. Usually you're going to see a performance dip till about week 14 in this case. Khalil Herbert is probably coming back this week he did have a pretty severe high ankle based on the progression and it does therefore project for a 15 percent efficiency dip in our data and it's unclear now it looks like they might have found two new backs to spread the workload around so unclear how much of that's going to go directly to herbert Dallas goddard dealing with a fractured forearm we still haven't really seen a firm timeline on this in most cases bone healing takes six weeks sometimes depending on where it is and how stable it is you can push a player back up to about five weeks for the return but in in most cases a fractured forearm if that's truly what it is ends up in that five to seven range aaron Rodgers, we do suspect he is coming back towards the end of this year December would be about three months and mid-December rather would be about three months so December January I think is a somewhat realistic target in the sense that he's willing to risk re-injury and he's willing to come back at much less than 100 percent if you remember back to how Joe Burrow looked when he was dealing with a right calf strain and again a right-handed quarterback dealing with a right calf strain is quite a bit different because he has to drive off of that right calf significantly, whereas Aaron Rodgers will be kind of using that left calf a little bit as a peg leg. So 
Aaron Rodgers, we suspect he can come back towards the end of December. I don't think he'll be able to run much, if at all. And I think you're going to be looking at some shotgun snaps, quick passing, but that's still probably an upgrade over Zach Wilson. So I think there's a chance. This could break all the precedents, and I don't think we'll see it really again because this is an older player with looking for a left calf strain on a quarterback who's right-handed. So it's a very special circumstance, but I, I think it is possible. Derek Carr, he is in concussion protocol. The shoulder issue, although it's a re-injury of his AC joint sprain, doesn't sound like it's that severe. So that shouldn't hold him out. The concussion protocol usually means he would be out this week, which is their buy anyway, and returning the following. Marshawn Lattimore, now by video, this looked like a moderate severity uh, high ankle sprain. And therefore, the average on these for DBs is around four weeks. Because they have the buy, it's a little unclear if he's going to go on the IR or not. It would be about that timeline, though, to see Marshawn Lattimore back. We do suspect he comes back by the end of the year, though. Minka Fitzpatrick still has not returned to practice. Even if he logs two limited sessions this week, he's still only going to be at a 50% chance of playing according to the data. Now, I would suspect based on the Steelers' recent experience with Deontay Johnson and Pat Fryermuth that they hold Minka Fitzpatrick out with this hamstring strain for one more week and he returns week 12. Jair Alexander, not a lot of details on this one available, but Jair Alexander has been held out of, so far of practice, and it's listed as a shoulder, and the ironic thing is that most shoulders don't cause huge extended absences, but in this case, it, it may be a little different. So Jair Alexander, as far as we know so far, no indication that he's coming back this week. Andrew Thomas, he had his knee rolled up on and he left the game last week he has returned to a limited practice if he logs two more limited practice sessions going into this weekend then we do have him as a 60 percent chance to play a little unclear what the actual diagnosis ended up being and you can't totally see it on video but andrew thomas we suspect he is going to be out there with the data favoring it just very slightly. And that is all I have for now, so I'll kick it back over. Uh, I mean, with these injury reports, Payne, Deepak's going to have to get paid by the word. I mean, we're up to 15 minutes, 16 minutes. It's going to get its own podcast at this current rate when you're highlighting all of the marquee players that are banged up, limited, or out for an extended period of time. You didn't even deliver the cool shit. And that the guy we have delivering injury information couldn't be here on Monday because he was he was operating on something. That sounds no, like that? a humble so, brag. I mean, that sounds like a humble in, brag. We know the he's the smartest the one we though. have anywhere around <laughs> Bet the Board. I mean, that's honest. He has the name Doctor in front of his title. Uh, but yes, clearly saving lives is much more important than providing football updates. Although I'm sure there are plenty of our listeners out there who might disagree. Yeah, I mean, they wanted that information on, on Monday, uh, but that was why he, he wasn't there Monday and uh, but, was, but was able to deliver all the key and pertinent information ahead of uh, getting your fantasy lineup set and your, your, your bets placed this weekend. So uh, just a laundry list of, of information there, including you know some key factors uh, that are partaking or not partaking in this evening's game as well between... The uh, Ravens. Uh, and the reason why Deepak won't be here the following Monday is because there is no show uh, for the holiday week. We'll keep you posted on social media when the joint NFL and college football program will go live. But rest assured, we have a full Monday night breakdown for you right here, right now, with the Eagles and Chiefs doing battle under the bright lights of Arrowhead Stadium in a Super Bowl rematch. The first Super Bowl rematch the following season where each team entered with the best outright record in their respective conference. It's the second Super Bowl rematch from the previous season that'll take place on Monday Night Football. Hasn't happened since 1997 when it was the Packers and Patriots. Andy Reid off a bye. Well, you know, the narrative is one thing. Uh, results are another. 30-6 and six in his 
career off a bye, 21 and 3 in the regular season, 7 and 1 in the playoff opener, and 2 and 2 in the Super Bowl. The Chiefs, meanwhile, are the number one seed in the AFC, but are averaging their fewest points per game in the Patrick Mahomes era at just 23.1. Six games this season under 24 points, tied for the most in a season since Mahomes took over in 2021. 19 points and one touchdown in the fourth quarter this season, both the fewest in the NFL. Meanwhile, on the flip side, the Eagles are the first team since the 2005-2006 Colts to start 8-1 or better in consecutive seasons. This is the second game of a six-game stretch that's a murderer's row of sorts where they'll face the Cowboys twice, the Chiefs, the Bills, the 49ers, and the Seahawks. Meanwhile, Jalen Hurts continues to win games as the Eagles starting quarterback, especially when they step up in class. The Chiefs, they've been an under-machine this year, going 7-2 and two under the total, tied for the third-best mark in the NFL, and the under has hit in five straight Chief games, which is the longest active streak. Paying the Eagles offense, we figured it could go through some growing pains, some fits and spurts. Jalen Hurts has dealt with a knee injury. A.J. Brown putting up video game-like numbers, but the ground game has really slowed in recent weeks. In steps a Chiefs defense that ex- is exceeding everyone's expectations. George Karloftis generating pressure in his sophomore season. Legereus Sneed and Trent McDuffie being a nightmarish matchup uh, for opposing receiver rooms and a Kansas City team who's taken their defensive identity to heart, going out there and performing as one of the top stop units in the entire league. Yeah, the run game hasn't been as efficient if you're comparing it to last season. I think you know there's some level of uncertainty to Jalen Hurts' health. Not that he won't play. I mean, he's playing. But, you know, is he going to be a willing runner past unscripted chaos in, in, in the tush push? And I think the loss of Steichen obviously hasn't helped. But when you're running, you know, a read option based run game and Hertz isn't willing to read and take off as often, that that's going to contribute to a decrease in rush efficiency because guys can just key on the running back. Defenses aren't going to you know, show Hurts as much respect. They're going to cheat running back. So you you look at it in totality. The Eagles are still sixth in rushing efficiency. They were just head and shoulders above the entire league last year. So that's kind of drawing much of uh, the criticism there. Based on the style of defense Spags and the Chiefs play and not having a great run stuffer in the middle, the Chiefs can be beat up down to down still on the ground. I mean, they're, they're bottom five in yards per rush allowed before first contact, 25th in rushing success rate allowed. So there's certainly a path on the ground for the Eagles to have some success here. Now in the throw game, that's where the Chiefs have been outstanding. You, you kind of mentioned all of those those cornerbacks who are playing extremely well. Feels like Trent McDuffie makes a freaking game-changing play almost every game now. That chief secondary third in schedule adjusted pass defense third in EPA per drop back allowed. I know the Eagles fans were banging the table to find a slot receiver. I don't know if Julio Jones is a slot receiver, but you did go out and at least add that receiver. But in general, kind of been like a a very condensed pass game in the sense of who Jalen Hurts actually throws to. A.J. Brown has been a monster number one in the NFL in team share of air yards. He makes up nearly 50 percent of the Eagles air yards the Chiefs have fared pretty well against wide receiver ones now I mean you know AJ Brown a different different animal but Spags typically devises a good game plan for number ones not to have them completely torch them and now that Dallas Goddard is out with the forearm injury I would think there's probably a concerted effort to get Devontae Smith more involved post by we've kind of seen Smith's target share increase almost seven percent when Goddard isn't on the field and when you pay closer attention to number ones like Spags does. Sometimes that can lead to a a secondary option being more involved and and playing a larger role, which I'd kind of anticipate there. I do think from the onset, you'll see Spags test Jalen Hurts mobility with some early blitzes. Now he's not blitzing as much as he once did, but still an above average league right there for the Chiefs in terms of, of sending pressure. That worked relatively well in the Super Bowl last season. I use that word very strongly relatively well because that was kind of the the times that Hertz did struggle a touch obviously he was fantastic but I, you also look this year Hertz has been at his worst against the blitz so far this season so you, you want to test that mobility and I, I think we'll see Spags at least dial that up early on prove that uh hey this is a guy that we don't want using his legs and then we'll drop back into coverage but I think you'll see at least a couple blitzes early on hey you have to try and see what some of your opponents are capable of doing and get Hertz uh, out of his comfort zone we'll see how that deep bone bruise has healed up if he's ready to go and provide a very unique and 
valuable element to everything that Philadelphia wants to do on the offensive side. Now, Kansas City offensively, Payne, I mean, this group, you keep waiting for it to gel. The reality of it is, look, the record is going to put them in great standing. They don't have to peak until the games start to mean a heck of a lot more down the stretch. And we know Patrick Mahomes usually elevates his level of play during the month of November. But you look at some of the numbers, 23 points per game uh, that I mentioned at the top, 280 points in a nine-game span, back-to-back games with 14 or fewer points generated by the offense, back-to-back games with under 275 yards, back-to-back games with zero second-half points, and while pass protection has been a strength for the Chiefs, just allowing 38 sacks since 2022, a best mark in the league, including a Super Bowl where Philadelphia couldn't get home, when you look at Kansas City and what they need to do offensively against this Eagles defense, Philly's been stout against the run, but they have been vulnerable with those short intermediate passing routes where Patrick Mahomes typically feasts. Well, let me ask you this before we we kind of deep dive this thing. What do you make of the Chiefs offense? How do you view them perceptually? Because outside world, it's like, hey, this this offense has fallen off a cliff. And I think if you're gauging them based upon the historically good offenses or the offenses that are number one in the league by a long mile, you have a leg to stand on the way they kind of feel like they're being talked about as if they were, you know, the, the Raiders offense or the Jets offense. And the reality is like, it's still kind of a fringe top five offense still finding its way that seems to have another gear. And in, in some, of I think it's scary games. for the rest of the league. If these young receivers start to figure it all out and you get maximum production out of Rasheed Rice that we've seen flashes of probably the number one receiver on the outside uh, for Patrick Mahomes Andy Reid uh, didn't mince words this week talking about how they've been very careful in terms of deploying Kadarius Toney, knowing he's still recovering from knee surgery. And we saw what he can mean to the offense as an explosive route runner and game breaker in that regard. Uh, And look, I mean, we saw it during peak Patriots years. I mean, you don't have to be playing your best football in September and October. You want to be peaking when the games mean a heck of a lot more in November, December, and January. And if this defense is going to be for real, it takes a lot of the burden off the Kansas City offense to be that high-flying unit we've grown accustomed to over the last couple of years where they had to mask some of the defensive deficiencies because not only were they unable to stop the run, they also struggled in pass coverage. Yeah, and I think specific to this game, it feels like it's going to be completely in the hands of Patrick Mahomes. I don't envision a ton of run game efficiency for for Kansas City, and I think that's one of the things that's quietly going under the radar. We're all wondering, hey, what's going on with the pass game? What's going on with Patrick Mahomes? The interior of the Chiefs O-line hasn't gotten the same push through 10 weeks. It's gotten the last couple seasons. I mean, you're looking at the Chiefs right now, bottom 10 in rushing efficiency, the Eagles defense, top three defending the run so I just I don't think there's a a massive path there for success but to your point the Chiefs' short passing game should really work here throwing over the middle to Travis Kelsey is is more than in play something we outlined last season you know the Eagles pass defense has not been good defending short throws last year it was bottom 10 in the league in EPA per pass attempt allowed on short throws this year it's bottom five maybe the Eagles throw a curveball off the bye schematically but the style of coverage Philly's used this season with Sean Desai hasn't been the type that's given Mahomes trouble. Even in you know a, a relatively down season where you know, the Chiefs offense isn't number one by a long mile, it's still feasted against man coverage, whether it's yards per attempt, passer rating, EPA per dropback. Mahomes is top three in the NFL against man coverage. Sean Desai has upped the rate of man the Eagles have, have played year over year, seventh highest rate to date this season i'm i'm not sure that works here kelsey is is going to have a featured role the eagles have not defended that position well this season bottom three and epa allowed to the tight end position struggle to defend the middle of the field maybe that changes with Bayard a little bit more comfortable in this system but on the surface that feels like the path i just think this is a pretty straightforward approach for reed and, and mahomes barring weather well you mentioned you mentioned weather. I, I mean, we've seen some under money. Do we think that's yeah. because of the expected weather or just because Chiefs totals have been well, inflated and we've seen under money almost every week? <laughs> uh, both. Now, you know, our model just screams under every single week for the Chiefs, it feels like. And there was some potential weather here. I, I You know how weather is. We're talking Thursday morning. By, by Monday evening, it could be completely different. So you're going to want to... You're going to want to monitor that. I believe, 
and I'm not saying under is 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 wrong here, but I think if the approach we're going to have is is what actually unfolds, where you've seen the last two opponents of Philadelphia use these pass heavy approaches, they're both division foes who know the Eagles best, or you would assume so, right? Like Sam Howell throws it 50, 52 times. Eric Bieniemy called that game plan. Disciple of Andy Reid. You can bet those two have spoken. Dallas came out. Dak threw it 44 times with monster success as well. You know, you're a couple inches away from, you know, having close to 40 points in that game if you're Dallas. I do think there's going to be a little bit of a continued battle here on the side. Uh, You know, at two and a half, we'll get a faction of betters saying, hey, like Mahomes and Reed off the bye at home, effectively just needing to win outright. I'm, I'm in. Where do I sign up for that? And that sentiment, you know, caused this line to move to three on Monday by Tuesday, right? A buy in the Eagles at plus three with the idea that, hey, like Philly was laying one and a half on a neutral in the Super Bowl. There's a four and a half point adjustment with the Chiefs offense that's perceived to be down a notch or two since that time. And so that's that's kind of the ongoing battle I think we'll see there. on. The I side. know what the records say these teams are uh, in terms of having the direct path to being the number one seed. Philadelphia's got their work cut out for them in the NFC. Do you feel these teams uh, as currently constructed are as good as the additions that we saw last year playing for the Lombardi Trophy? Uh, the power rating say no. Both of these teams are, are down, you know, point, point and a half from, from where they were. Maybe, maybe, yeah from what they were last season off the cuff. Like, I think you have a very clear seven. And I don't... Do we talk about this off air? Maybe it was ahead of the Lions-Ravens game. Or maybe it was actually ahead of the the Ravens-Seahawks game where, you know, you had the Seahawks kind of in that, like, 8 to 12 range. And I just said I didn't see them ever being able to sneak into the top seven because of, of Geno Smith. There's a very clear top seven, right? It's, I'm just not going to give the exact order, but in some form or fashion, right? It's it's San Francisco, it's Baltimore, it's Miami, it's Dallas, it's KC, it's it's Philly. I believe that's seven teams, right? Philly, Miami, Dallas, KC, Buffalo, San Francisco, Baltimore. Yeah, that that's like the clear seven. And I think those are the teams with, with far and away the – the ability to to win a Super Bowl. Now, within that, like, I don't know if Dallas can actually do it. And you could say, hey, like, if Cincinnati gets fully healthy, they're, they're going to be in that that mix. Neither of these teams right now are power rated how, as high as they were when they met each other in the Super Bowl. Is there a path here now that you add Bayard that you could potentially get a healthier Jalen Hurts when Dallas Goddard returns that they could potentially reach that peak, right? You have an offensive coordinator with with more time under his belt as a play caller. Does he get a little bit more familiar with things? Does Kansas City find that guy? Do they get the right matchup? I mean, all of these teams are so close, right? The the top seven, so to speak, is can be interchanged by like 2.8 points. That's how close that top seven. So it becomes very much predicated when they meet each other in the playoffs on matchup. Is there going to be someone who decides to play man coverage against Mahomes and, and the Chiefs? Is there Are they going to face a team offensively that's more pass and, and, and can't actually run the ball? So the teams are so close. To me, that's what makes this playoff so interesting is that it's going to be very, very much predicated. Bill on matchups, matchups and health. It is a war of attrition. We'll see which of these teams come in operating in their full capacity when we get to the postseason about two months from now. Like we said earlier, you can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And Painter, it's time for the best bet portion of the program. Uh, no Monday show as we highlighted, so uh, feels good to get that off our plate early on with a fully extensive Eagles and Chiefs breakdown. Uh, but what have we seen in terms of early week movement and where there may be an opportunity for our listeners to exploit? So, you know, we talked off air, we went through a couple options here. I think what the most intriguing option at this point is is going with rotation number 452 the Cleveland Browns there's a lot of pick out there you know you can get minus 05 on the money line at pinnacle right now 
and I know it's not going to be something that excites people going to to war with DTR, but I just I think the best unit on this field is the Browns defense. We've now had the Pittsburgh Steelers continuing to defy the odds, been outgained in all nine matchups. When I just look at our power ratings and I say, what is this team with without Deshaun Watson? We still have the Browns about one and a quarter point better on a neutral neutral field than the Steelers. So, you know, say you give you give two points for home field advantage here or you're you're kind of pushing towards a number closer, closer to three. And so I think, you know, the the narrative here is is that DTR, you know, threw up on himself in his first start. And and that's accurate. I just feel like, you know, now this game plan is going to be a little bit more catered towards towards him. He's got the full week repping out with the ones. It isn't. We're not quite sure Deshaun's going to play this week. Oh, he shows up at practice and throws a little bit on Friday. Like, I just feel like that's that's the right path. We've had Cleveland in this spot before with what I would deem. It, maybe the floor is the same, but I do believe DTR has a higher ceiling than a PJ Walker. Again, we've looked at PJ Walker's data for his career. I mean, he is he's bottom of the barrel. He's he's Josh Rosen status, and you know they're able to to win games just battling it out with defense against better teams like San Francisco. You really start to go through the the data points for the Browns, and and they become more impressive the the closer you look at them. And and boy, that's a that's a tough injury there with with Deshaun Watson, what they could have potentially had. I didn't, you know, I knew in the moment the defense was good, but you start kind of going through the schedule and how they've played these teams. I mean, you, you go into Seattle with PJ Walker, you get punched in the face early. You're still able to battle back with PJ Walker. Now you give up the game winning drive, you lose the game. But it's been very impressive what Cleveland's been able to do with some of these injuries and the adversity. And so I just value wise, situational wise, spot wise, it just it feels like a very nice buy here on the Browns. Again, you can get minus 105 on the money line at Pinnacle. There's a bunch of pick um, with a total at 33 in a game that, hey, could could potentially be won by by one score here. You know, you don't want to lay the one if that's your only option, but uh, plenty of pick out there, plenty of very very nice money line options on the browns this week so let's go shop with the around best back. available best unit on the field the cleveland browns defense uh you hope that pittsburgh is in the spirit of the season and is generous with the football a team that's protected the ball exceptionally well poised to have a little bit of regression in that regard if cleveland can get in there make life difficult for kenny pickett uh and the browns ground game is able to get on track against a banged up linebacking core for the pittsburgh steelers all right my friend uh nfl in the books as far as podcasts are concerned now it's all about getting the games to come home the way we draw them up. Anything else you'd like to share with our loyal listeners before uh, we wish them the best of luck this upcoming NFL and college football weekend? No, look forward to reconvening next week. We'll do a mix of the college and NFL like we usually do every year ahead of Thanksgiving. We'll have a little bit more details on on when to expect that, but... uh, We'll chat then. Best of luck to all of you, our loyal listeners, the guys and girls out there that will be finding their way to the wagering window this weekend. And with the Cleveland Browns ticket in hand, come Sunday afternoon, we'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.